goddesses of beauty, charm, nature, goodwill and human creativity. Let's talk about the Harites, Muses and much more. Hello all you funky people, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. How are you? I hope everything is going well. On today's episode we will continue with the Pantheon building by talking about the Harites, the Graces, goddesses often associated with the Seasons and the Muses. Then we'll talk about the Muses themselves and I have something extra in store for you in the final part of the video. Whether you are a world builder or just stopped by for the historical trivia, welcome. I'm really glad to have you here. For the world builders and storytellers out there, this episode, I'm sure, will inspire and help you expand your world, make it feel more interesting, more alive. You can easily copy-paste the stories I will impart with you or tweak them to better fit your world. Your choice. If you aren't a world builder, I am sure that with the info you will get by watching this video, you could enthrall those around you while chatting about random stuff, or you could just use this information to annoy the living daylights out of them. Again, your choice. Either way, I am sure that most of the things we will be talking about were not taught to you in school, so stick around, it's gonna be worth it, I promise. Now. With all of that said and done, let's talk about what I will be painting today. On today's episode, I will continue painting my 7 Adepta Sororitas miniatures. It's only fitting, given the topic of this video. For each miniature, I decided to try a different technique or approach and see what happens. For the first miniature, I went with the instructions in the Warhammer magazines with little to no embellishments. For the second, I tried a sort of slap chop for the first time, now I'm going balls to the walls all in and will spend a lot of time going for heavy highlights, following Juan Hidalgo's Battle Sister painting tutorial. Check it out if you wanna see a real master do it. I will leave the link to his video in the description below. This time around I'm not going for zenithal priming, instead I am painting the miniature in Ushapti bone as a base and start applying paint and only later come in with heavy highlights. It's an interesting approach, to be honest, and I am glad I tried this method out. Thus far, of all the miniatures I painted, I like this the most. This is a method I will try to master over time. Because my paints were starting to dry out, I added some medium to them, and in the case of Ushapti Bone, I went a little heavy on the medium, and now the paint is a little watery so I had to apply two thin coats for a nice cover. You might have to do the same, just keep that in mind. You want a very smooth base coat. Corn red as a base for the garments, black for the armor, coal black for the bolter, Corax white for the mask and insignia, while for the highlights, Thunderhawk blue, Fenrisium and Grey Seer, Magenta pink horror, Fire, Dragon, Bright and Flash gets yellow. The good stuff. Oh and by the way, Sorry for the blurry miniature, I didn't notice that most of the video is like this. I wanted to scrap it completely, but I really liked how the miniature turned out, so I kept it. Oh well, back to history. Alright, before we jump in, we need to get through the pre-story checklist. If you want, you can follow along. For starters, I have my lovely, lovely assistant with me here. This is Potato, I'm sure you know her by now. I have some very very tasty coffee in my mug i have some lovely fruit tea in my mousse cup and of course as usual i have something something for the soul how about you oh by the way you can follow along with this pre-story checklist make your own and if you want you can share it down in the comments below and you can substitute any of the things i have with something that makes you happy Alright, with that, I think it is time for the age-old question. Are you comfy cozy? Do you have something tasty to drink on hand? Perfect, then I think it's time for a story. So, perhaps you already know or have heard about the graces, the haritas. There are many expressions that include them and I am sure you have them in your languages or at least heard the English versions. 
Some of the best known examples are a saving grace, be in someone's good graces, fall from grace, graced with something, grace period, and there is even a slightly darker one, coup de gras. The British, well the English, took this ad literam from French. In essence, it means, for those unfamiliar with the expression, delivering a mercy killing blow to end suffering or to avoid worsening a situation. In French, it literally means blow of mercy. But why do we keep mentioning them? How did they become so ingrained in our collective memory that even thousands of years after the ancient Greeks worshipped them, we still mention them? Well, let's find out. The ancient author Hesiod identifies three graces, three haritas. Agleia, translated as the shining, no, not that shining, she was mentioned as being Hephaestus's wife. Hephaestus was the Greek god of smithing, metalworking, craftsmen in general, but also artisans like sculptors and artists, but also fire and volcanoes. The Romans had another name for him, that of Vulcan. He is a very interesting god and he will get his own video in due time, but you know the drill, that's another story for another time. Aglaia was the youngest of the graces and she had four children with the god of smithing. Efclea or good repute, Ephene acclaim, Ephenia prosperity, and Philophrosine welcome. Aglaia had two sisters. One of them was Ephrosine joy. She is the goddess of cheer, joy, mirth, and her name is actually the female version of the word Ephrosinos, meaning merriment. And the other sister was Thalia, blooming. She was also considered to be one of the nine muses. We will talk about them soon enough as they are an intricate part of the pantheon. When she was considered to be one of the graces, her name was used as an adjective when describing feasts, meaning plentiful, luxuriant or abundant. But when being considered one of the muses, she was the muse of theater, of comedy and idyllic poetry. She is described as a giggling woman with a crown of ivy, a shepherd's rod, boots and a theater mask. She was tasked with entertaining the Olympian deities and she had nine children with Apollo, the god of light and music. But as you might already know, if you've watched some of my videos, religion evolves, it changes throughout time in order to better satisfy the believers. Depending on the day and age our sources date from, we can see how at one point there was only one Harite, one grace, and other times there were more than three. Most of them are linked with beauty, and having multiple muses that are linked to beauty indicates that the ancient Greeks divided these deities and this concept in a multitude of ways in which beauty could manifest itself in the world, and these deities represent these manifestations. They were believed to be the daughters of Zeus and the Oceanid every nomen. But, as you might expect, this is not something the ancient sources agree upon. As the Greek peninsula was, in ancient times, a collection of independent city-states that had many similitudes, they also had many differences. Depending on the time and region, the Haritas were believed to have been the daughters of Zeus, with either Hera, Evrinome, Evnomia, Evridomene, Harmonia, or even Lethe the embodiment of one of the five rivers that flow through Hades, the river of forgetfulness. And it does make sense if you think about it. Even to this day, we believe that one could get lost in song and or dance and forget everything around them or forget their worries, dancing their worries away. In other parts of the ancient Greek world, they were believed to be the daughters of Apollo and Egle or Avanthe or even the daughters of Dionysos, the god of wine, and Aphrodite, or even Koronia. In Sparta, they worshipped two Harites, Cleta and Fena, while the Athenians had Auxo and Hegemone. 
If you've seen my last video on the seasons, you might recognize these names. So there is an overlap between the seasons or the Hore and the Harites and also the Muses. The ancient author Sostratus mentions that in Aphrodite's entourage, there were three Harites. Pasithea the youngest, married with Hypnos, the god of sleep, Kale and Ephrosine. I will give you a list of the different Harites and their portfolio so you get a better idea of what their roles were and how diverse the legends around them were in ancient Greece. So we start with Ahea. She was in certain parts of Greek called Kaleis or Haris and she was the goddess of beauty, adornment, splendor and glory. She was one of the three original uh, Harites, her sisters being Euphrosine and Thalia. Achaea was also the wife of the god Hephaestus, as I mentioned earlier. Then we have Anthea. She was the goddess of flowers and flowery wreaths uh, worn at festivals and parties. She was one of the attendants of Aphrodite. We have Auxo who doubles as a Hore, or one of the seasons, actually the spring. She was the representation of spring blossoms. She was worshipped in Athens alongside Damia and Hegemon. We have Evdemonia, the goddess of happiness, prosperity and opulence. She was described as being especially beautiful and she was part of Aphrodite's retinue. Ephrosine, as we mentioned her earlier, she was the grace of good cheer, joy, mirth and merriment, and she was sister to Achaea and Thalia. Then we have Hegemone, a Haris worshipped in Athens alongside Auxo and Damia. Actually, she was one of the embodiments of the Hore. We have Cleta, the Haris of fame and glory, and she was worshipped by the Spartans in particular, alongside her sister Fena. We have Paedia, the goddess of play and amusement, Pandaisia, the goddess of rich banquets, and she was also part of Aphrodite's retinue, Panikis, the goddess of night festivities and parties, and again she was a member of Aphrodite's retinue. Pasithea, she was the god of relaxation and even perhaps of hallucinatory drugs. We have Patho, the goddess of seduction and persuasion. Phenea, we just mentioned her, one of the two Harites worshipped by the Spartans. And Thalia, the Harite goddess of festive celebrations and rich and luxurious banquets. None of them, or most of them, have not survived in literature, but they have survived on pottery. Yes, on pottery. They were depicted alongside either their sisters or the deities they accompany mostly. How do we know their names? Well, the Greeks had the habit of painting the names uh, of deities or heroes or mythological creatures on pottery during the crafting process. And these names have survived throughout the ages. These pots would have been either used um, in ceremonies dedicated to these um, deities themselves or they were believed to have been not necessarily blessed by these deities, but by adorning the uh, pots with the names of these deities, they were something of a good luck charm, more or less. Now, the main roles of the Harites was actually to entertain the Greek deities during feasts and parties, but their portfolio included many other smaller roles as, first of all, you just heard, but there were other minor roles that the Greeks believed had a massive impact. For example, the Harites alongside the seasons, the Hore, weaved the robes Aphrodite wore when she was born out of the foam crest of the sea. Well, she was born and she then was dressed by the graces and the seasons. 
they also bathed the goddess of love when she wanted to seduce Anchises, the legendary father of Aeneas, the Trojan prince, and the ancestors of Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. This is all so complicatedly intertwined. Besides being part of Aphrodite's retinue, they were also said to have spent a lot of time singing and dancing alongside Apollo and the Muses, seeing how one of them was actually a muse. There were also festivities dedicated to the Harites called the Harisia, during which the participants would dance all night. At the break of dawn, those who remained awake, managing to make it through the night, would receive cake. That's a very cute and very interesting uh, festivity. But regardless of their names, the places they hail from, portfolios, lineages, etc., the Greeks believed that these goddesses were born out of the need to fill the world with good memories, happiness, and goodwill. It's a very heartwarming sentiment. With this, I believe you have enough material to easily include these minor deities in your world. Either copy-paste them or tweak them to better match your world. If you're wondering why I gave you that lengthy list, well, it's quite simple. To show you that the ancient Greeks had a plethora of deities that they could not agree what their full portfolio or even their origins were. Secondly, to show you that if the Greeks tweaked them to suit their needs, so can you. Basically, imagine an order of clerics or paladins dedicated to joy, merriment, and dance. It might sound weird, but it would enhance your world. Imagine your players hearing wild stories about this crazy acting clerics and paladins. Have your players hear rumors about such weird individuals, or you can come up with a background story about such an order and present it to your own game master. The possibilities are endless, and there is one more hidden reason for that list. I for one always, always struggle coming up with names on the fly. So there you go. A list of weird names from a far off land. Now, I think it is the best time to take a short break and talk about the miniature. I am now working on the armor. After I've edge highlighted with Storm Vermin fur every hard line of the armor, it is time to do the same with Thunderhawk Blue, but adding highlights only to the upward facing edges and on areas that catch the light such as the thigh, shoulder pads and the power plant. This is a more heavy-handed way of conveying the idea of light bouncing off of surfaces. The layers have to be built up slowly, at first with thin down paint as to create a bit of a halo. And the transitions from one color to the other has to be done first with a 50-50 mix of the previous color and the new color before applying the new color in pure form. This ensures a smooth transition and a halo. The last color has to be in the dead center of the highlight. For example, I went in with pretty thin storm vermin fur and painted highlights on the thigh. Then avoiding the very edges of the highlight, I added a coat of storm vermin fur plus thunder hawk towards the center, 50-50 ratio. Then thunder hawk to accentuate the color. Then I came in with Fenrisian gray plus thunder hawk, then Fenrisian gray on smaller surfaces, then Fenrisian gray and gray sear, and pure gray sear right in the center of the highlight. You need to think of how light bounces off of somewhat polished surfaces and do it in smaller and smaller areas. Oh, and you need to add your very first edge highlight to every edge you find. Don't forget this, it's very important as it helps divide the miniature in panels and it allows anyone looking at your miniature focus on different parts. And it looks so great! Back to our Pantheon. Okay, because at the start of this video I mentioned human creativity and because the graces overlapped with two other groups of deities, the Hore, the Seasons and the Muses, and because I've already talked about the Seasons, let's take some time and talk about the Muses. 
According to the ancient Greeks, the Muses were the goddesses who inspired literature, arts and the sciences. They were believed to be the embodiment of the knowledge held in myths, stories told around the fire, songs and poems. In central Greece, where it is believed the Muses originated from as deities, initially there were only three Muses. Metele, she was the Muse of thought and meditation. Her name meant in classical Greek to ponder, to contemplate. Iodem, she was the muse of voice and song. She was a daughter of Zeus and Nenosine, the goddess of memory. And if you think about it, it makes sense. The easiest way to pass down knowledge was, and still is, through stories and through songs. Think about the alphabet song. That's the simplest example. This is how lore keepers, the first bards, preserved and passed down knowledge. I actually have a two-part video on bards and lore keepers if you want to find out more. Link is right over there. And the last of the muses was Neme. She was the muse of memory. In Delphi, one of the most important oracles in the ancient world, especially in the Mediterranean area, Three muses were especially held in high regards, Nete, Mese, and Hippate. Their names represented the names of three of the chords of ancient lyres. They were intertwined with music. And, in this case, intertwined with sacred music. As time passed and religion evolved to meet the needs, the new needs of the worshippers, the number of muses grew to nine. We had Calliope, she was the muse that presided over uh, eloquence and epic poetry. She was considered, according to Hesiod and Ovid, the most prominent, chief among all muses. She actually had two famous sons, Orpheus and Linus. She taught Orpheus to play the lyre and Linus was taught eloquence. Both were very skilled in both arts, but each mastered one of them. Linus also became the embodiment of lamentation, and he was, as myth has it, the inventor of the harp. He was either killed by Apollo because he rivaled the god when singing, or by Heracles, also known as Hercules, when the artist, <coughs> sorry, when the artist was trying to teach young Heracles to play the harp because the youngster did not appreciate what he was being taught and because he was quite lazy, Linus punished him oftenly by using a rod and Heracles at one point just flew into a rage and used the harp to strike down Linus. Heracles was then found innocent by a jury of his peers for the murder of Linus because he argued it was in self-defense. Orpheus, on the other hand, is well known for being the one who descended into the underworld to retrieve the soul of his young wife. His singing melted the hearts of Persephone and Hades, and even the Furies and the Fates were touched enough to let him pass unscathed. Calliope was also the wisest of the Muses and the most assertive. At one point, she defeated a group of women, all daughters of a famous king, in a singing contest, and punish them for their insolence by turning them into magpies, thus creating these birds. She was believed to have been Homer's inspiration for the Iliad and the Odyssey and Virgil's muse when writing the Aeneid. Oh, and she was believed to be the mother of sirens with the river god Achilles. We had Cleo, she was the muse of history. She was also known as the proclaimer, the glorifier and celebrator of history and of great deeds and accomplishments throughout times. She is depicted with either an open book, a parchment and a set of tables, ancient writing implements made out of wood and um, beeswax. And also with a trumpet and a clepsydra or a water clock. She was also considered to be the daughter of Zeus and the titaness Nemosine, the deity of memory. She had a son, Hyacinth, 
a clever and kind divine hero and lover of the sun god Apollo. We will talk more about him, but not now. You know the drill. Another story for another time. We had Erato, her name translated to lovely or to desire, and she was the muse of erotic poetry and mimic imitation. She is the one who charms the sight and she is represented holding a small lyre or a kitara, an instrument of the god Apollo. We had Efterpe, her name translating to rejoicing or delight, and she was also known as the giver of delight. She presided over music and over lyric poetry, but this came into play only later. We had Melpomene, her name translated to the one who is melodious. She was the muse of tragedy. She is represented as holding a magic, a magic, a tragic mask in one hand and a knife or a club in the other. She is also mother to several of the sirens, members of Persephone's retinue, ones who were cursed by the matter for not preventing her daughter Persephone's kidnapping by Hades. We had Polyhymnia, the name translates to the one of many hymns. She was the muse of sacred poetry, of hymns, dances and eloquence, as well as of pantomime, and even of agriculture, weirdly enough. She's also the muse of geometry and meditation, and is often represented uh, dressed in a long cloak, veiled, um, holding a finger to her mouth and resting an elbow on a pillar. Her son, Triptolemus, got to ride in a chariot drawn by dragons and teach all of Greece agriculture. That was a very, very strange twist. We then had Terpsichore, her name translated to delight in dancing, a muse of dance and chorus. She is also a mother to sirens, including one named Parthenope, who threw herself into the sea to drown because she could not entice Orpheus with her songs. Just for clarity, in Greek mythology, sirens were not half women, half fish. They were half women, half birds, or simply winged women. Next to last, we have Thalia. Again, she was one of the graces we spoke of her earlier. And last but not least, we have Urania. Her name translates to heavenly, and she was the muse of astronomy, a goddess of astronomy and stars, and she is represented holding a globe and a compass, clad in a cloak with stars, staring up towards the heavens. She was also in charge of philosophy. People in ancient times knew that the world was round, just so we're clear. Her son was Hymen, or Hymenaios, the god of marriage ceremonies who inspires feasts and songs. He is a winged god of love, one of the Erotes. We'll talk about them more another time. You know the drill? Another story for another time. It was believed that he had to be present at every wedding ceremony, otherwise the marriage would end in disaster. So the ancient Greeks would go around calling his name before a wedding ceremony began, making sure that the god was present. Legend had it that Apollo fell in love with him at one point and they were lovers. Urania is also associated with universal love and is considered the eldest and the wisest of the muses. As you can see, the Greeks were preoccupied with clearly separating the types of inspiration. But what is interesting is how intertwined all of their myths were. And this is just scratching the surface. There are people who study and interpret these myths their whole lives. And that, I find that truly inspiring. Okay. Now, we have a full pantheon to play around with. I would personally make these entities part of the retinues of different gods, perhaps being lieutenants, advisors, confidants in my world. Actually, I did this. 
I made them minor deities who are in charge of inspiring artisans to deliver magnificent works of art, wondrous inventions, perhaps the source of inspiration for wizards to come up with new spells, or, or they could be magnificent artists and artisans that your players can meet when visiting other planes of existence. Their work being so wondrous that mortals on the prime material realm consider them deities. The only limit of how you can implement these deities in your world is your own imagination, so go nuts. Okay, I think it's time for another break. Okay, we are nearing the end. Garments done, armor done, power plant done, now for the belts, buckles, bolsters and purity seals. I think I might be forgetting something. Oh yeah, the bolter. Again, I couldn't bring myself to painting it in a solid metallic color. I just couldn't. I thought it would look weird AF if I did so after how much effort I put in painting the rest of the miniature, all the highlights, everything. But next time, I promise I'll think about it. For the smaller details, you can easily make use of contrast or speed or express paints. I did this here with the parchment. Base of Ushapti bone, then skeleton hoard contrast, then came back with Ushapti to reapply highlights. This really shortens the process and allows me to focus on the bigger parts more. With black templar contrast, I am adding prayers on the parchment to avoid being labeled a heretic. Now for the mask. So, the base color was Corax White. I applied Apothecary White contrast to add shadows, and now I came back with some gray sear to add some variety, then final highlights, again Corax White. The secret to painting white is to not actually paint white. That's why you should play around with off-whites and then add the final highlights in pure white to sell the idea. Otherwise, it just looks weird. Now, back to history, let's wrap things up. Okay, because we spoke of deities in charge of song and dance, we should also talk about their cousins, the Coribantes, a group of well-armed dancing warriors from Asia Minor who worship the Phrygian goddess Kybele. Now, there are several varieties of such fraternities, both in Asia Minor or the Near East, in the Greek colonies and the territories closely related to them, and on several isles of the Mediterranean. Although these fraternities have different names, these names are quite similar as you will find out soon. And they are also similar in function and practices. Initially, they were said to be the nine sons of Apollo and the muse Thalia, of whom we just spoke. They were tasked with worshipping either Kybele or her Greek counterpart Rhea. They would don armor and arm themselves with shields and spears, then dance to the rhythm of drums and foot stomping. The ritual dancing in armor was part of a coming-of-age ceremony for boys who were transitioning from adolescence to young men. On the Isle of Crete, these dancers were strongly associated with Zeus, or a Cretan version of Zeus actually, who was considered to be the chief among the armored dancers, go figure. Imagine Zeus dancing all clad in armors to the rhythm of drums. That's, that's a Interesting image, actually. One of these similar fraternities or brotherhoods was the Korets of Crete. They were believed to be, according to myth, the guardians of Zeus while he was still an infant. In order to drown out the cries of the infant god hidden in a nearby cavern, they would loudly bang their shields with their spears and stomp their feet as loud as they could while dancing. They did this because they wanted to shield, to protect, to hide the infant god from the cannibal titan Kronos. They were also there when Dionysus was born 
as well as Zagreus, a child of Zeus and Persephone, or perhaps of Hades and Persephone, depending on the area, age and author. Zagreus was the first Dionysus and was paired with Gaia, the Earth. Most likely he was an important deity in the underworld, but he was at one point torn apart by the Titans and he was reborn in the form of Dionysus. Later, this deity was completely removed from the Pantheon and Dionysus came to prominence becoming the god of wine. Basically, actually, he was kind of the god of drug sex and rock and roll. Just, yeah, let's be honest. The Greeks believed that there were actually several civilizing activities that allowed civilizations to rise. Among these activities, they believed that were the cornerstones of the civilized world were dancing, singing, and winemaking. They did all three. They danced just for pleasure, they sang for pleasure, and they made wine and they had a god that was in charge of winemaking. For the Greeks, winemaking was perhaps the easiest way to distinguish themselves from other nations who were drinking harsh, strong alcohol and got drunk really easily, while the Greeks enjoyed Dionysus' gift without getting plastered immediately, or so they would say. These groups of men, warrior dancers, were also considered a very basic primitive form of magicians and seers, given their uh, primeval, primordial connection to Zeus, as well as they were considered to be magnificent smiths, who, in ancient accounts, were said to have created almost magical items. Like with the deities mentioned before, they too could be easily integrated in any fantasy world, food stomping at all. All of these stories are just a glimpse of what the ancient Greeks actually believed, as much was lost to time. But as you can see, they were amazing world builders and storytellers. They created this whole pantheon with deities who were capricious, jealous, who had parties and got drunk, who fell in love and suffered, with as many stories as there were perhaps villages out there or fish in the sea. They created deities they could easily relate to, deities as human as they were, and in some cases, the regular, average Greek folk were perhaps better than their capricious gods. And on this note, we'll end today's episode. If you enjoyed this video and found value in it, please make sure you like this, shows me that it was useful and encourages me to put out more videos. Subscribe and join this growing funky community and make sure you hit that bell so you are notified whenever the next video is out. And if you want to help more, make sure you share this video with your friends, your DMs, your GMs, your storytellers, creators, players, neighbors, friends, family, pets, everyone. Oh, and if you want to see more of my lovely assistants, make sure you check out TWCreative hyphen or minus cats, a channel with shorts that have nothing to do with history and everything to do with cat adventures. Potato's eighth name is Lady. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time. I truly hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today. And I can't wait to see you all funky people here on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of mini painting, history, world building and trivia. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and never ever stop world building and creating amazing things, whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are awesome, so don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Cheers.
and Philophos and Philophrosine. She was tasked with entertaining the Olympian uh, of Apollo and Egle or Eusane or Awan Cryptotelemus in charge of inspiring artisans to deliver magnificent 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 sorry 